We start with what we call the 20 annotations. Those are 20 introductory reflections that uh, initiate the experience of the spiritual exercises. And then numbers 21, which are editorial numbers, those numbers put in brackets, number 21 and 22, which are uh, a presentation and a reflection on the title of spiritual exercises. And then in 22, it's so-called presupposition. What, what is the environment in which the exercises will work most uh, effectively? So the first thing I would like to point out to you is to give some understanding of the spiritual exercises which follow and to enable him who is to give them or her and him who is to receive them or her to help themselves. Later on, I'll say more about this idea of uh, helping and how important it is within the context of Ignatian spirituality. It's a rich word, it's a rich idea, and we'll try to keep unpacking it as we go through these expositions, but I wanna underscore it now. With the spiritual exercises, it's not a compendium of the spiritual life, it's his take on one aspect of the spiritual life, which is the journey towards God and towards f discovering in that journey where God might be leading me and guiding me. Now in the first of these annotations, Ignatius describes the process in terms of physical exercise, like strolling, walking, and running. That is, it's progressively more focused physical activities. The analogy is important. It's, it's just not throwing down three physical activities. They're in a progression. Strolling is just meandering. Walking is a more determined pace to get somewhere. And running is the haste that you add to it to get there in a hurry. And if you notice that developmental progress, it's not an accident. It really is the eye that invites us to understand that one of the keys to understanding the spiritual exercises of Ignatius is to look continually for this sense of progress, of uh, a measured advancement, of development, of evolution. It's in the very nature of the exercises. And so this calling attention to what can be a throwaway line saying physical exercises, I said, no, it's measured physical exercises. And within that, there is an increase and a change. I wanna make a, an insistence on this for two reasons. The more obvious one, of course, is it is really is a developmental reality. Okay, that's there. But also, we don't understand that if we hurry through the text. And I think too often people read into the text what they want to find there, and along the way they lose so much richness that Ignatius has used as a kind of encasement for what he's talking about. The language is important. We're going to be using a very literal translation because it's closest, I think, to the autograph edition of Ignatius. The analogy underscores an overarching characteristic of the exercises, their focused movement towards discovery. And that's what I want to emphasize there. What's the discovery physically in strolling, walking, running? It's the discovery of how much you can sustain in your body. There's a discovery there, huh? Well, Ignatius is saying that in these exercises, you're going to discover how much you can find about God in your life and who you are. There is a, a, a reverence that Ignatius has for the primal sacrament in the exercises, which is the individual woman or man making them. They have been created by God in order to develop within themselves instincts that allow God to become more and more a partner in his or her life. And that's developmental. Um, and this is what I mean by the title of the series, the dynamic of the exercises. What I mean is what Ignatius will describe as to seek and find the divine will, to look for it and then to embrace it, to look for it and then to embrace it. What's the it, the divine will? Well, let's, that's an important question. Let's hold that off until we move more and more through the series 
and understand how the idea of divine will is a very rich understanding for Ignatius, not of something that is part of God, but central to the way in which God loves is central to the way God is. And we will say more about that this evening. Now there are texts that is a compilation of experiences that are designed to help the one giving the exercises to do so with some sense of being part of a tradition. There is something about moving into spiritual direction that is inherently of its very nature lonely. You know, there are things people tell you that are confidential and you can't share it with other folks. There are things that you aren't sure of how to express and therefore you don't even know how to frame the question sometimes. And there's also just moments in which you really have to say you are as expectant as is the one making the retreat of what God is doing. So it's hard to formulate the expectation without making it a performance, without programming what you're going to have. That's very hard. You're going into a situation in which you are totally dependent on how God will lead the person and totally dependent on how you hear how God is leading the person. Now that's what the security comes, I think, in realizing that the text you have to help you, not to entrap you and not to dictate to you, but to help you in this process, is a tradition. It's a handing on of wisdom by people who have done the exercises about ways of doing them more effectively or better. And it was a text that Ignatius continued to work on all throughout his life. And in a sense, we who are in the inheritors of this spirituality are contributing to the tradition. Every commentary is contributing to the tradition. Every time we give the exercises or make the exercises, we're contributing to the tradition. We may not write it down, but it certainly is recorded in the effective collective heart of the faithful people who are part of this. And there is a way in which God passes that wisdom and understanding and compassion on to other generations. The exercises are also <clears throat> not only a text, but they're a pastoral adaptation of the text to the rich set of realities that constitute the relationship of the one making the exercises and the one who gives them and the triune God, Father, Son, and Spirit, who is the ultimate overseer of the entire enterprise. So not only do we have a text, but we have a text that of its very nature invites a pastoral response. What is a pastoral response? a way of being present to the text and to the person moving through its reality in a way that helps the person. And so both the one making the exercises and the one giving the exercises and the God of the exercises are really helping one another to come to an understanding of how the experience can be contextualized, come to a reality in who I am, in who I am. That's helping a person, allowing the reality to be at home with who I am. And finally, the exercises are a constitutive part of a wider and deeper reality, which we call Ignatian spirituality. This includes the Jesuit constitutions, the spiritual diary of Ign and Ignatius' letters. In this third set of reflections, I'm gonna move that way. We're gonna look at the text then we're gonna look at the pastoral context, and then we're gonna look at the wider scope of Ignatian spirituality, okay? <clears throat> so let's look at the text. The introductory annotations are wide-ranging explanatory notes. In effect, they are the first of the directories that uh, set of reflections from people giving the exercises uh, out of their experience, both as being guided and being especially the guides, uh, what works, what didn't work, what to be careful of, what Ignatius might mean by something. They were guides to help the text become more vitally personalized through people doing the spiritual exercises. Now, of these 20 annotations, 
Some are intended directly for the exercitant. Exercitant, the one making the spiritual exercises. <clears throat> Parenthetically, I will try to talk most of the time about the one who gives the exercises and the one who makes the exercises. Ignatius never talks about director and directee. That's our later language. And, and there's something in there, remember said about modesty? It's very important. The director is God. And Ignatius is very strong on not presuming you are God, even though people are ready to see to you more authority sometimes than you deserve in that spiritual direction, spiritual conversation context. <clears throat> it was Ignatius' own practice to give the exercent in annotations 1, 25, and 4 at the very beginning. One just describes what they are, as we've just looked at it briefly. 20 talks about, in the ideal situation, a 30-day experience in solitude is probably a most effective way of doing it. That, too, will always yield to where people are and what they can do and cannot do. But the idea of solitude, the idea of a certain persistence, the idea of focus, the idea of giving God a priority in time and space, these are very important for Ignatius, and they're all <clears throat> contained in that annotation 20. Annotation 5 is very important, and annotation 5 talks about one of the major dispositions that allows someone to enter the exercises. The fifth, is, it is very helpful <clears throat> to him or her who is receiving the exercises to enter into them with great courage and generosity toward the Creator and Lord, offering him all his will and liberty that his divine majesty might make use of his person and of all he has according to his most holy will. What is that saying? It's saying that the most important thing you look for at the beginning of the spiritual exercises is someone really wants to make them because the person wants to do something with her or his life. Okay, the desire to undergo an experience that will widen my ability to respond to the way in which God might be calling me, even though I do not know what that is. You can't do anything if folks don't want to do it, you know. If they're there because <clears throat> Mother Superior has sent them or the bishop has sent them, it won't work. If they're doing that because everybody's doing it, I may as well do it too. It's a kind of spiritual cosmetic. It won't work either. Uh, you have to see from the very beginning that this is a free act. This is something the woman or man <clears throat> undergoing the exercises really wants to do. There's a desire for it. They may not always have spelled out that it was spiritual exercises, but you look at the initial conversations either before the exercises or during them, you look for the sense of, I want something more in my life and I wanna take the time to find it and somehow it involves God. The language may not be precise, but the affectivity that is communicated is very clear. It's generosity and what Ignatius calls a certain generosity and courage. It's a <clears throat> strange word. What is courage? Think of the way that both Aquinas and before him, Aristotle, talked about courage. Every virtue is always a mean. It's not cowardice in which you flee from adversity, but it's not recklessness in which you assume a potentiality that you do need, don't have, you know? You, you really shouldn't be out there playing with the big boy, you know? So it's the ability to look at being courageous with what I am and who I am in order to enter into whatever God might ask. <clears throat> so the very beginning of the exercises, you're looking for people that are not ordinary. It doesn't talk about intelligence, although that may be part of it. And it doesn't talk about having lived an especially good life, although that can be helpful but it's talking about the deepest ambitions of a person's personality that make that woman or man want to do something 
that's answerable to the absolute of my life, which governs the, the non-negotiables. This takes a lot of time, and sometimes the preparation for the exercises I think should especially center on this ability to see whether the person is going to grow or be in some way burdened by, or both you giving the exercises and the one making them are going to cheapen them by not putting the edge that should be pre present in the making of the exercises. So Ignatius looked from that from the very beginning. Uh, the fourth simply tells you what the weeks are and the fact that people are going to move differently, uh, and therefore, uh, as it says here, um, you go through various spiritual movements. So from the very beginning, a person entering the spiritual exercises has a sense of what they are, how they're constituted, uh, the environment in which they will probably best come to fruition, to life, uh, mostly, where am I? as I enter into this, where am I? Do I really want to do this? What the text offers, as I put here, is a wise and yet venturesome reflections often encased in language that sounds ascetical rather than personal, and we'll try to unpack a little bit of that. So the one who makes the exercises very compactly, what? Should see the importance of words and phrases like every way. Okay, in the very first annotation. Every way, you say, well, uh, well, maybe it doesn't mean every way. Maybe it means only special ways. Now, from the very beginning, you realize there's a certain yielding on the part of Ignatius to a kind of messiness of reality that you're going to deal with. You are not programming people to do what Ignatius says. Because what Ignatius says is discovery for you who give the retreat as much as the one who makes it. You, you discover that, okay? So every way means that somebody may come to you and say, I find God most contemplatively present to me when I say the rosary. You say, oh, well, no, I don't want you to do that. Or someone might say to you, I really find God more present to me when I think of what Ignatius offers, but then I go and I allow that to be part of my life as I walk through the woods. Or I find God, especially when I walk in places that are crowded and noisy, but my heart is still. And I allow that reality of the buzzing humanity around me to touch my soul in ways they otherwise would never be touched. The exercises are very much like good poetry. Good poetry is not secluded from reality, it's not secluded from the author, it's not secluded from the circumstances. You can write a poem about anything, anything. That's why it, poetry is universal, exhaustive. So at the very beginning of the exercises, it's important to understand that Ignatius allows a certain capacious entrance into how you're going to get into these spiritual exercises as the one who gives the retreat and the one who makes it begin to measure out what they are like when they have a focused attention on searching for what God might be saying to me in my life, okay? <coughs> Preparing and disposing the soul to rid itself of all disordered tendencies. Again, here's where you have to unpack the, the language a great deal. Preparing means I allow myself to use all of the freedom and the human reality I have to be focused, to be present. You're not going to be a good counselor if you are not really focused on the people that are talking to you. You aren't going to run a good parish if you aren't focused at what the real pastoral problems are that people are bringing. What are, what are the problems that people keep bringing to me as recurrences in their struggle to be good Christians? There are patterns that we are attentive to, huh? Okay. That's preparing myself to have patterns of being open to the way I know God works in my life. It's little things sometimes. Uh, it's realizing that I'm not going to really pray significantly 
if I keep reading my mail, I ought to get rid of it. It's not good for me. It doesn't help me. And I understand that. It's not the whole retreat. You're not saying that being able to abstain from the curiosity of reading your mail makes you undergo a good retreat experience. You're just saying it creates an environment in which the retreat experience can, can happen, can take effect. Disposing, opening the soul, and I want to be careful here. In the gloss on the Constitutions, when Ignatius talks about souls, most of the commentators, George Gantz and others who reflect on the meaning, he means animas, he means the living person, the living person, not a disembodied reality that's floating out here somewhere, but the soul is the animated person, the person fully alive, the person alive to all her or his realities, history, possibilities, that person ought to rid itself of all disordered tendencies. Right from the beginning, I think it's important for me to say to you that there's nothing that has created more difficulty at the beginning of the exercises than people think the exercises are something you undergo in order to regiment your life, to do the things you know you should have done, but you haven't had the courage to do them, okay? That's volunteerism. It's urging yourself to comply to the norms that you think should regulate a good life. That's not the spiritual exercises. But there's a lot of commentary, especially beginning with many of the German commentators, that for many years had a hold on the exercises as being voluntaristic, of allowing you to be strong enough to do the things you know you ought to do. Why do I insist on that? Because the exercises are basically revelatory. They're about what I come to see, not about first what I do. Only when I see what God is asking of me should I try to do it. And that means that there are many false idols along the way, violating the first commandment practically, the idols sometimes of official pronouncements, the idols of parents who continue to linger in the corridors of my own sensibilities, telling me how to be a good boy or a good girl trying to get a good grade in the spiritual life the way I lived all my life. We live with young people today who have really been programmed to perform. And it's very difficult, and I think it's one of the reasons they sometimes distance themselves from religion, is because it's one more instance in which what is reinforced is, I have to measure up. It's not about measuring up. It's about the discovery of who God is for me and who I am before God and what God is inviting me to see will make me what? A, I don't wanna, I wanna be careful of the word, not a better person, but a more authentic person, truer to who I am, more open. Later on, Ignatius will suggest that one of the forms of prayer is to go through the 10 commandments and the example that's used is to, to reflect on first is the first commandment. I will not have false gods before me. And the reason is so often we do have false gods before us. So from the very beginning in these annotations, there's an exploration being invited through the text to look at who are the false gods that have tyrannized the way I come to God and do I see them as false? Now, I said it's not regimentation, <clears throat> and therefore the words uh, disordered tendencies, what do you mean by disorder? Does it mean, for example, I eat too much, I drink too much? That might be true, and maybe we shouldn't do that for all kinds of reasons. But you don't make a retreat to come to know that. You might make a retreat to find out why you eat too much or why you drink too much. There might be far more radical reasons of insecurity and fear of loneliness that you gradually uncover that can happen, whatever God wishes to lead. But the order that Ignatius is talking about is the order of the virtues. 
What orders the virtues is charity. Love governs every other virtue. If you are abstaining and you are rigorous, but all the while you're saying nobody else is as good as I am, you've already, what, put a canker in your performance. If you say I'm humble and nobody else seems to know it because they're not as humble, well, you know, <laughs> something's eroding that virtue right there. So the order is the way in which you are led to love. So what Ignatius is saying here, how do you make your reality Get rid of all those things that make you a not very loving person. A not very loving person. The contemplation of attaining divine love is not put at the end of the exercises like a thrill of discovery. It's an evolutionary process that you've been what, coming to understand all through the work of the exercises. <clears throat> And then <clears throat> acts of intellect and reasoning, acts of will that Ignatius talks about. Again, the language can, acts of, it sounds like I'm, I, I by design think of what this means and I reason about it, or I think of how good God is and I reason about the fact that I should love him. It's not that at all. It's talking about the movements that I discover in my life, I would put it in this language, more and more show me what my non-negotiables are. What are the things I really would not give up without feeling my personality has dissolved like an Alka-Seltzer tablet in water? I've lost who I am. <clears throat> and acts of will are, and what are the things that I not only value, but I really cherish? I care about them. I am invested in them. I have an affection for them. It's the uncovery of <clears throat> the authenticity of what is central to the way I make decisions, what is central to the way in which I embrace those decisions as being something that matters to me. And Ignatius will say later on that when we are reasoning about God, we can afford to argue and ruminate, explore, but when suddenly we discover that we love this, cherish the movement of love. Don't question it, cherish it. Later on, you can examine where that might lead, but at the moment, what's most important is to be able to understand what it is in you to really embrace something as something you love and care about. You know? We all love our children, we love our nieces, we love our nephews. But sometimes it's only at the moment when we might lose them that we understand how much we have loved them, how much they have become a non-negotiable, something that I really will work for and give up in order to be able to have that reality part of my life. What Ignatius looks for then is someone capable of being consistent and generous so that the dynamics of grace can operate in the mind and the heart. That's how I would summarize it. That's what you're looking for. The one who gives the exercises ought to present these as preludes to prayer. These are the various exercises that we'll look at more closely as we go through the various weeks. But important, they're not lectures. You're not giving people theological insight so that they can feel they haven't wasted their time, they're coming out of this experience knowing how to talk better about God than they did before. That's not what the exercises are. So a good director will let a lot of dumb stuff float by theologically because it could interfere with the person grasping what God is saying. There'll be time in a more appropriate way to gently point out that you might want to look at this later on, later on, okay? They're not homilies. You don't give the exercises with inspiring little talks to people about how much they should love Jesus. Let Jesus do that, okay? Now that's hard because we are all do-gooders. We want to get in there and we want to make sure people think right and love right and really are moved by what we're saying means so much to us. And they're not lesson plans. 
It's not a program that people go through in order that they might have a mastery of the text. Sometimes people will say, well, I really want to know more about the spiritual exercise and Ignatian spirituality. That's why I'm doing the exercises. I said, well, why don't we wait until you really want to make them for you and not to perform? Huh? That gets in the way. Gets in the way. Paying it, and now all these numbers I have refer to the annotation so that it's a paraphrase, but I'm hoping you will see how this constitutes the qualities you want in somebody who is the, giving the exercises. Paying attention to the movements, 3 and 17, movements, affective attractions, affective reminiscences. It's the affection that is so important here. Facilitating the gradual assimilation, taking into oneself the one making the retreat of the discernment of spirits, gradually seeing I am doing discernment of spirits. Ignatius is very careful to say you don't start explaining the rules for discernment of spirits until people have been discerning the spirit practically. Then you use what's helpful. Some of these people say, well, we really didn't go through all the rules of discernment of spirits. I don't know whether I had a good director. He probably had an excellent director. Mm -hmm. The rules are for the director to help you as needed. It's not a lesson plan, okay? Um, and to facilitate this accomplishment through prudent adaptation of the text to the human and spiritual personality of the one making the exercises. That's what the guide does. He presents, uh, he offers some reflections as needed about the discernment of spirits, or she, and then always adapts this to where the person is, okay? Finally, as a process, the exercises culminate in a relationship between creator and creature, which Ignatius characterizes, and I don't mention it, it's annotation 15, bracket 15, characterizes as an effective communication with effective, effective felt, effective of drive to do something, an orientation of movement to the future. It is more fitting and much better that the Creator and Lord Himself should communicate Himself to His devout soul, inflaming it with His love and praise, effective communication, and disposing it for the way in which it will be better able to serve Him in the future, effective, the decisions that move you to the future, a, a drive, an attraction, towards what do I do about this? Where do I go with this? Okay? This orientation to the future is tricky, and it's here that the one giving the retreat must help the one making the retreat towards what I call transparency before God, and that's what's mentioned in Annotation 16. You want to be open before God. Good, good deeds should be done, but not every good deed should be done by me. Not every good deed is good for me to do, okay? So that's what annotation 16 underscores. So this is what the exercises are about, choosing within the mystery of God the better service I can give to God, okay? Now that's the text. All through these exercises, I'm going to continue to unpack the text because that's your working tool. What I have here opens up these first 20 annotations in terms of a text. I keep telling people, you can never exhaust the richness of what the text says. You can find more and more meaning in it, and that meaning will help you become a better director. If you don't understand something, then look it up, work through it, live with it. See what this could possibly mean, like disorder. You know, well, it means organizing your life so you do the things you know you should have done. No, it doesn't. But can you see how that can really misfocus the whole exercises in being a, what? A kind of, you're going to come out of this being a stronger person. You may not. You may come out of being a much weaker person because you are accepting where you are before God and you no longer have to be the bulldozer in the life of your family or where you work or how you deal with people. 
You, you learn how to lose a few battles in order to be somebody a little bit more amiable and a little bit more reflective of the tenderness and the availability of God. It's weakness, if we've been listening to our scriptures these past week in Corinthians, weakness is a wonderful gift God gives us. It's not a liability. That the mystery of God is ultimately the, the fragility of God's love. It's not forced, it's offered. And it never takes away our free will. All right. Now, the pastoral adaptation <clears throat> certainly is applied in the correct reading of the text, fitting the exercises to the person, but it is more sophisticatedly embedded in the presupposition. That presupposition simply says, when you enter into the exercises, it's very important on both parts that the one giving and the one making the exercises trust one another and give each one the benefit of the doubt. Uh, I can't stress that enough. I think we're probably going to come back to it again and again, and we might want to do more in discussion. But all Ignatian pastoral activity is mutual. The helper is helped, or otherwise the helper is not a helper. It's a little bit like if the doctor doesn't listen to the patient, the doctor's not going to be a good doctor. The patient helps the diagnosis. So one of the constants in St. Ignatius <clears throat> is this idea of mutuality, that when you come as one making the retreat to me, the one giving the retreat, we are mutually helping one another. So how I listen, what I hear, the questions I ask to make it clearer for me that I really am listening and understanding what you're saying are very important, very important. For Ignatius, God is a helping God. <clears throat> in the autobiography, The Journey of a Soul, what Ignatius talks about is his core experience at Manresa was that he discovered God was a helping God. That all the kind of ascetical gymnastics that he had undergone didn't bring him God, God brought him God. <laughs> and God gradually taught him, take care of your health. Take care of your mental stability. Other people are not the enemy. They're people from whom you can learn. And gradually, Ignatius saw, if God is a helping God, then the most important sign of God's presence as helping God, a helping God is consolation. The early ministries of the Jesuits were called ministries of consolation because they were doing the work of the helping God among people, forgiving, teaching, clarifying, embracing, reconciling. They were the hands of God. And therefore, these were ministries of consolation, the helping God. That was his great discoveries, I said, for the pastoral reality of the exercises, both the giver and the receiver have to trust that God is working <clears throat> within the relationship. You may not like all the things that you discover about the one giving you the retreat. There might be a little idiosyncrasies and things that annoy you. That's not always bad. That's a good way if you can get beyond it to begin to understand. But the most important thing is within the relationship of the guide's hearing and the advice the guide gives me, do I gradually see how God is working? And therefore, can I begin to see God who is behind what I present and how that is accepted or heard or understood? This cluster of spirituality, God is a helping God. God communicates within relationships as well as in solitude. There is no relationship without mutual trust. All these reveal the fundamental consolation as one begins the spiritual exercises. That is that God's providence is individual and operationally constant. And I want to stress that. What, what is said in the presupposition is you've got to believe that God has chosen for whatever reason we can examine it, we can discuss it, we can analyze it, but ultimately we do not understand that the mystery of God <clears throat> is that the omnipotence of God comes through the fragility and the weakness and the vacillation 
and the limitness of what it is to be human. Adam and Eve strove to be like gods and they lost their humanity. Jesus, Paul tells us in 2 Philippians 1 to 11, Jesus threw aside all of the trappings that people give to God in order to embrace all the reality of what it is to be human. And therefore, as Rahner would say, there's no Christology that's not an anthropology. There's no understanding of Jesus that is not an understanding of what it really is to be human. And in John, when Pilate points to the stripped and beaten and humiliated and totally ostracized Jesus and says, Ecce homo, this is the man. He's saying, this is what it is to be human. It's to love when every reason for love has been taken away from you. But they do not capture your soul. What is it to be human? What is the loving you and the loving deed? Um, now, God's providence working that way is what? For Ignatius, there is a recognition that God's providence is the overall governance of the universe. That's true. But he's far more concerned with the way you discover God in the immediacy of your own human context and in the limits of your own human reality. <clears throat> the so-called experimenta, those experiences that Ignatius put his young novices through, all of them have one touchstone. They discovered how God works in each one of our lives in different circumstances. In the hospitals, with dying people, on the pilgrimage, not knowing what I'm going to get next, in the work I do that's lowly in the house, in the teaching of catechism and so on to little kids who have nothing to give me but their ignorance. God gradually is teaching me how God works in these concrete, specific realities of life. Christ ripped the moment of the holy away from the synagogue and the temple and put it into the marketplace that we might understand that's where God can be found. Did never denied that there is an intensity of worship in the temple and in the synagogue, but it was not exclusively the place where God met people. So finding God in all things is finding the providence, the way God works for good in life, to bring people to an understanding that they are loved and capable of loving. That is God's providence. Um, so basically in these first 20 reflections and then in 21 and 22, it's orienting the person to understand that as you and I go through this experience together, we trust one another because that is the way in which God will work best. If something comes up we don't understand, of course we should question one another. But not to argue, but to discover what's really meant, where are we moving? Something is troublesome to me. And maybe in that kind of exchange that we will have, there will be moments in which the one giving the retreat will say, if this bothers you, what I said, don't worry about it right now. Forget about it. Don't let it become an issue. And you will find that again and again, with the erosion of the evil spirit, whatever that means, however the evil spirit works, the erosion of that evil spirit is always to distrust the process. It's too boring, it's too slow. I really don't understood by this person. I was giving a retreat not too long ago to a tertian who at the second day retreat said, I don't know what I'm going to do because how can I give, how can I make a good retreat with a retreat director that I don't think likes me? And I said, you shouldn't even worry about whether I like you or don't like you. You should worry about whether God likes you, you know, and you like God. I said, if this drives you more and more to believe God is guiding your retreat, that's the greatest gift I could give you. This is not, you and I are not in, we're not trying to foment a personal relationship. If God wants it, that will develop. But maybe God is asking you and me both to abnegate immediate satisfaction to find the way that you can become more and more radically dependent on God leading your retreat. And I promise you, that's what I will try to do. If you feel I'm interfering with God, you let me know. We'll talk about it. But we're not going to get into discussion about our relationship, which is a hook. You know. 
let's talk about us. Oh, <laughs> oh um. <laughs> and you can get into that. The exchange invites that kind of phony intimacy and say, well, if people don't like you, then won't it be harder for them to like God? Maybe, but maybe you could hope that they would get beyond that and work beyond it, but I would never fixate on it. So the wisdom in this text is, is immediate. All right. Now I want to talk about Ignatian spirituality, and I'm going to paraphrase the things I have here. What I want to point to here is the text can give you the words, the language, the movement. Pastoral reflection can give you how this fits to where people are and what you're looking for. But now, what nudges you to an understanding that both enriches the exercises because it's part of a wider spiritual tradition and how it contributes to this wider spiritual tradition. It gives you a sense of horizon that we eventually will call Ignatian spirituality. There are many things here, but the ones that I have centered on are three. The pilgrimage in the life of works of Ignatius, the role of conversation during that pilgrimage, and eventuating out of this, a revelation is effectively embraced truth. Something is revealed to me when it is effectively embraced by me. It's a truth that I've embraced. When Ignatius went to Manresa, he began to think of himself, maybe antecedent to that at Montserrat, but think of himself as the pilgrim, one who was on a journey in order to find, through visiting the sacred, a way in which God was speaking to him. For Ignatius, that became the journey to Jerusalem. But gradually, God led him to understand that the whole process of his living was a pilgrimage. It was a seeking for the way that God, even before I was born, was bidding me, leading me, guiding me, revealing God's self to me. And so today, people talk frequently about the spiritual journal. If you look at the New Dictionary of Christian of Catholic Spirituality, it's a very generous entry within that compendium. And the point that it makes out, and I think is very true of Ignatius, is to understand that in the exercise that you're going through a pilgrimage. Notice how often, even in the 20 annotations, Ignatius will talk about the way, the way. And people say, well, that just means a method. The repetition is very reminiscent of what he talks about, Ignatius talks about, in describing the society of Jesus. Quedam via adeam. It's a kind of a journey or a way to God. So what Ignatius is saying, not only are you learning a technique, a way of doing your prayer, but you are learning part of the pilgrimage through prayer of finding where God is. That was very strong in Ignatius. The pilgrimage. Not just as something Ignatius did once, but as a constant evolution in his life of what it meant to journey towards God and find God. I don't want to distract too much, but the missionary activity of the early Jesuits was not simply the urge to save souls, to bring the gospel message. It also was to continue the pilgrimage of discovering God where God has not yet been discovered. And so when the early Jesuit missionaries went to Japan and China, the Middle East, Latin America, Africa, they kept sending things back to Europe and saying, we found new ways that God is present in these cultures and these societies, and we did not know it. So they were not sending back artifacts, they were sending back testimonials of the discovery of God in people that Europe didn't even know anything about. And so scholars today will say, why did these Jesuits who went over to be missionaries do all these other things? And the answer is because they were testimonials of how God is present. Now the glue that holds a pilgrimage together is conversation, not just talking to one another, but the mutual self-disclosure about what is important in my life, the non-negotiables, and about my effective cherishing of these, my love. And out of that would come this realization that as I journey through life 
and I understand the beauty and importance of self-disclosure as a window to another person's soul, God has wanted from all eternity to give me that window of self-disclosure that is God. And how do I know it? I know it when I am effectively engaged by a truth as being true for me, for me. Okay. So, any observation, question, inquiry? John. Okay. Th these false gods that I have to deal with uh, that have uh, maybe tyrannized my relationship to God. Well, what if a person has a, a really screwy notion of God? Uh, maybe a deistic understanding of God or um, a terribly intimate, uh, you know, God talks to me uh, all the time. Um, in other words, what do you do? How do you deal with the, the, I'll call it the a priori about God that the person entering the retreat takes into the retreat? What do you do about that? Uh, that's an excellent question. Uh, and the example you give, if, if, it, if something that verges on a pathology, like someone really believes that she or he has a direct communication constantly with God. And uh, they don't really have to answer to anybody for their total life because God is always telling them what to do and what to be, or they have that assurance. Uh, I would want to make sure that, that the exercises are going to be good for that person, or at least that I would be good for that person going through this, that I could handle the kind of obsessive certitude that I have this kind of communication with God. I think that's that's scary in a way. And it's hard to, you cannot use the retreat situation as a, a kind of remedy for the pathology. And you try to find a way that's humane and um, Christ-like to help the person see that maybe they're not ready right now for the experience of the exercises because uh, you have to surrender a little bit of your sureness in order to have a little bit more of doubt in order for God to enter into your life in new ways. If God cannot bring you revelation, but only total confirmation of everything you already have believed and there's nothing new, it's going to be hard for you to make the exercises. But I do think that the I just read a book on, it's, it's on leadership. It's an excellent, excellent, excellent book. And the author was, talks about the fact that he had worked very hard to get tenure at the Wharton School of Business. But the most important part of his life is when he and his wife were able to get pregnant. And when he held his new child in his arms, and this was a, a, a change for him. He said, I want to make a world that I can be happy to give to my new child. So he came into the first class that he was teaching at Wharton and talked about the experience of birthing and how transformative it was of his life. And he said half the students said, we didn't pay our big bucks to hear you go on about your kid. Get back to the text. And the other half said finally somebody was bringing our life into our profession. And then he, out of that he began to talk about what is it to be a good leader and what he comes back to, and I find more and more people talking about, is the moments that are non-negotiable because they have really demanded from me an allegiance and a fidelity, a loyalty, a foundation that I can't give up without giving up who I really am. And I feel about this. And this guy's talked about, I feel strong enough about it that it recreated the way in which I go about teaching what it is to be a leader and how important it is to find in your human experience these moments. Then, equally important, how are these tested out in the arena of other opinions? Do people understand what I'm saying? Is it challenging? Uh, is it confirming? And can I hold in that discussion these non-negotiables that I have? Uh, I really believe that. I think that in getting the non-negotiables 
to let them emerge in a person's life and to see them and to see that some of these non-negotiables are not healthy, like success. Uh, and you say you're not always going to have and the first time you really face not being successful is going to be very important how you handle it, how you go to God and say, I'm still loved and lovable, even though I haven't been the person I thought I ought to be and, and, and opening that. I don't think you can program it, and I think what, I think a lot of this and so far, sometimes it takes time as you move through the retreat. At least for me, it's given a more, more healthy insight into why humiliations are so important, why poverty is so important, because it brings you to the issue of who am I when everything I think I am or I've shielded myself with or I've allowed other people to think I am is taken away. Can I still say I think I am an authentic person before God? You know, that's, that's what I think Ignatius brings you to. So your question is good. I think, suppose you need more cases of how you would do that. But I, the extreme would be you can't let a pathology continue in the exercises. It would be disastrous for the person and also for the way the person would talk about it. But at the same time, you're, all of us have false gods. You know, God is constantly, like health. You think your health is good and you're going along okay, and suddenly something is taken away from your health. And you realize a lot of what I, what I translated as being energy and zeal was just restlessness because I was healthy. When I'm not healthy, I don't want to be nice. I don't want to answer the phone. I don't feel like talking to people all the time. And I realize that there's a, it's not untruthful exactly, but hidden behind physical assertiveness is also the realization that other people die, but I don't. And suddenly you face that and you'd say, but I die. That's, that's strong. And there is something about thinking yourself immortal that is a false god even though people would laugh and say oh I didn't really think that but I did and when you face the situation where you realize you're not immortal there's a kind of renegotiation with authenticity that has to go on that's why I think death is hard sickness is hard does anybody have a cheery question <laughs> <laughs> It's about the um, expectations on the part of people who are making the exercises. The experience that I had with it was here at Holy Trinity, and it, it's, it's very different. It was a whole group of people, as many as 12, 15 people going through months of it, meeting every other week and then doing the daily prayer. What about the, what do you do, how do you, should you get into the expectations of those people that are going through it in terms of, you know, the overall arching one is the seek and find the, uh, you know, the divine, w yes, that's the ultimate one, but, but it is so broad, you know, and it, it right. can mean so many things for so many different people. How much should the expectations of those going through it be, be addressed at the beginning? That's an excellent question. You know, even maybe five years ago, I would have said how important it is to have a conversation in which you and the one making the retreat talk about the person's expectations, what they're looking for, and so on. Um, I don't feel that way anymore. I, I feel more confidence of saying they'll emerge. As we go through the retreat, I'll begin to see what patterns of conversation this person has about consolation and desolation, about the way this person approaches our Lord when you get to the second week. And in the evolution, what is very important is noticing how the expectation of Jesus in the gospel narratives constantly challenges or confirms, but it certainly encounters the, the expectations of the uh, one making the retreat. Like, let me give you an example, a trivial one. Not trivial, so I think it's a great one, but uh, Jesus weeping over Jerusalem. And you say to someone, "What would you approach the Lord in his tears uh, 
ask for an insight into what he's saying to you. And then you listen and say, well, I wanted to comfort the Lord. Then you realize all through this retreat, I, this person who's a good person and generous, but it's an old person's idea of services to be the comforter, to help people not have bad days. And therefore, the underside of this that you also can hear is, and therefore I back away from saying anything that would hurt people. Uh, I don't want people anyway not to like me because then I couldn't help them. I couldn't be a helper. And gradually you wait to see if these two come together where the expectation of Jesus is simply that he will tell the truth and reveal who God really is. And then we have Luke 15, the prodigal son. Is this really God, a God who would run in public and embrace crazy God that would reinstate this nitwit son back again in charge of everything? Is that really what God is like? Is that what really God is like? And then now, and is this what really God is like? That only through somehow the son laying down his life does God feel he can reveal or she can reveal the immensity of what that love is. And the person will have trouble saying, I have trouble with the mystery of God. But that can be the moment of great grace where you say, I have so much yet to learn about the paradox of who God is, but I'm willing to learn it. And it so challenges the way I look at what I think is really important, the way I pray and where I am. My experience has been that this gradually evolves. And like you don't settle everything in the spiritual exercises. But what you give is a person of a window to walk through into the immensity of the treasure house of grace that God has. It can come in so many different ways. And the person walks away and says, what I got out of this retreat was I can never look at life the same way I did. It's a constant learning experience. And I guess I want to be very cautious about absolutes. Now, for me, that means a lot because I woke up one day and said, the only absolute really is God. Everything else is relative, relative to who God is. And therefore, when people tell me they're really sure, or they know, I said, I'm not that sure. I think I have the duty to walk authentically with the sureness I possess, but I have to have the humility to know that can be changed. I can get new data, you know, can see new things. So I think the question you have is that it's almost patiently walking with see how that evolves through the retreat, but you being very conscious that there is a certain ambiguity here in the person's life. John and I both had a wonderful spiritual director in tertianship, Paul Kennedy. And he told me once about a very talented uh, British tertian, last year Jesuit training, and the man was always very guarded with him. And then at the final eight-day retreat, about the third day, the guy came in and he started telling Kennedy all the stuff that was really going on that he never talked about. And Kennedy started giving good advice, telling him what to do, what to look for. And at the end of the eight-day retreat, the man was supposed to leave tertianship. He said to Kennedy, did you know all this was going on in me? He said, I suspected it. Well, why didn't you say something? And Kennedy said, you weren't ready. And then the guy said, what if I left tertianship without having you told, telling me this? Then I would have to believe that God would have someone else tell you. That's so powerful to me. There was this great master telling me that you don't have to pretend that all these things have to be done now by you in the exercises. You know? So that's where I am on it. You know? uh, my name is Ernesto. I'm from CLC. Uh, for those who know CLC. Uh, I would like to know, Father, how you deal with this problem. Uh, and the problem is this, that it's, it's not easy to guide or to give exercise to somebody you know very well or somebody you have a personal relationship with. How do you deal with that kind of problem?
That's a really good question because so often people will ask you to give them a retreat because they like you and they see you around a community and think you'd be a good person to talk to or they hear you and you get to know them and you hit it off with the person. Uh, it depends, you know, if you, if you can see that that human personality really has a desire, growing desire, you know, to, to find what God wants me to be and to be truthful and authentic before it, to be, to be real before this. You can say, well, you, may, you don't even have to mention it if you feel that's a good thing to do appropriately to say, no, I don't want our relationship to get in the way of this. I want to have your permission from the very beginning to challenge you where I think you need to be challenged. You know, And by that, I don't mean telling you what you should do. I mean facing what you tell me is going on in your life and what I feel of sometimes are blurred sections that are inconsist inconsistent. And don't, are you okay with that? I would clarify it along the way gently. If it is something where you say, I know this person so well, and this person knows me so well, that they're going to find me comfortable because they don't, I don't live everything I'm expecting them to do and to pray about. Then I'd say, let them go to somebody else. Yeah, I, it's, it's, a, it's a judgment call, you know. Cases are always good because they bring out the, the practical existential dilemma. But what's hard about answering them is because they, they, they allow a lot of different answers. So with one relationship that really is one of friendship and people can be together and talk and share and it doesn't interfere with your guidance, you're comfortable with that. And you know it can go that way. With others, you'd say, I don't think, I think that it may be a retreat where either I would begin to back away from asking you to look again at something because I don't want you to feel you're not performing well. You know? And therefore, I think it'd be better for you to go to somebody else and be able to say that. It's a, it's a judgment call, you know. Uh, John? Could you talk a little bit about how you process or review a session with a review and with a retreatant when the session's over? Excellent question. You know, in the rhythm of the exercises, Ignatius has this period where he talks about re the, what making the exercises reflects. And I said, once you get over the few days at the beginning where you say, what didn't I do too well? Should I have prayed better? It really is an opportunity to see and to explore things you didn't notice during prayer, but they're recurring attractions that you're beginning to notice. They're new ways of looking at things you hadn't thought about. There's an area that's challenging you and you're not comfortable with it. And you realize that as you look back, you are systemically not sharing with me, who's giving you the retreat, things that might be very important about the retreat. And it might be good to, to look at that. So too for the director, I think you look back and say, what, I always have to get a little bit of a break, go get a cup of tea or coffee or something, then go back and say, where, how do I feel when I'm with this person? Am I basically comfortable and I'm really listening? Uh, or for me, I would say, do I find that halfway through, I think I've heard this before and I'm supplying the answers before I really hear the question. What, what has been the authenticity of my own response to this person? Have I really heard the person? And sometimes it's good for me to take a note of what I think the person said. And even when they're talking to me, I might make a, I said, do you mind if I unjot something down? And I look back on that and say, this is, this is important. I don't know why. But I'm drawn to it, I'm attracted to it. I want to think about that a little bit. And then I might begin to notice along the way that three or four or five times in a row, this person has emphasized something like fear, and even using the word fear, or I feel inadequate, or I'm hoping Christ will give me the strength to do the things I don't think I could do. And you begin to notice that there's a pattern here of fear 
and it's it's diffuse, but it's in the personality, and it's creating a, a barrier between the kind of openness you'd like to have as a person. You know, I'm af I'm afraid of what I'm going to do or what I'm going to say. So I would find that the review of your own affective response, why you have that affective response, and whether there's any pattern for you to verify that, those are the three things I think helpful. Effective response, why do I have that, and is there a pattern here? Is there something that's recurring again and again? And I might not even say anything about it, but I might notice it and more and more find it uh, important to hear and see how it's challenged and changed. Uh, just a little example, but this is a novice, and the novice had um, been in a diocesan seminary and left, then some years later joined the Jesuits, but he had a great uh, suspicion about friendships and people getting to know him too well. And the reason eventually which came, and I mentioned to him, I said, now, I, I, do you feel at home with our Lord knowing you as you are and loving you? I just said something like that. He said, now, do you feel like that? He says, no, I don't. I think if Christ really knew who I was, he'd walk away from me too. Oh, I said, okay. Well, I said, no, you have to know, I don't, I don't talk like this. But I said to him, I want you to go to our Lord under the cross and let him invite you into the wound on his side and tell me what you find. And a young man came the next day and I said, now, Gene, did you find? Oh, yes. The Lord invited me into his heart and I found there was all kinds of room. And he said to me, don't you think there's room for you here? Well, the kid, you know, later on was telling everybody, Howard reads, reads souls. Why don't we read anything like that? But I did notice the reticence. I was trying to think of something that was, I said, why is he going into the cross and has to go into it? Why would I do it? I had no idea. But it was, it was, it was a breakthrough in the retreat. He began to realize that he may always have the liability of being slow to trust that he was lovable. But he goes back to that there was an er experience where that lovableness was confirmed, not by me, but by God. I, I couldn't give him that, you know? So that might be a good thing for us to think about more and more of how we can be more attuned after the experience of a conversation uh, but, you know, even I, I was thinking that I, there are people I like, but I notice sometimes I go away and I'd say, we kidded about other people, we gossiped about other people, and while it's funny, I go away feeling empty. I don't like that. I don't like me being part of it. And I kind of really suddenly say, this is not good for me. It, it brings in all the things I don't like about being smart-assed and being clever pseudo clever and I don't want I don't want to be like that you know and then so I look back on those in my life those circumstances and say I know that's not good for me or you look back in circumstances and say I like a drink but I don't like the way we in a cer certain group maybe we drink too much and whenever I'm there I always drink too much I don't want to do that anymore you look back on it and you notice how you feel why do you feel this way and the pattern that you say, every time I leave, I don't feel like I've been enjoying myself. I've been pretending I do, you know? I'd like to ask, how many of you have gone to parties that some people throw, and you, you don't really want to be there, what's your goal, it's social, you, and, and you go away and you'd say, why do I go to a party that I don't like, and I don't feel really rejuvenated when I leave it? This is, it's not really a party, you know? It, it, for me, and to have the courage to say, I don't want to, I don't want to go to those parties anymore. There, I can read a book, I can pray, I can go to a symphony, I can do a lot of things I'd rather do. I'm just not going to perform for other people 
that way. I don't, I'm not going to be nasty about it or mean. I'm just going to say, no, I don't want to do that. It's not, it's not enjoyable to me, you know. I mean, I think we do that in life, and I think that's what we do in this circumstance. Okay, thank you very much.